And we all looked at that great big hole uh, and said that that's going to be a problem for Newcastle as it's been a problem in many games this season. Well, hello again from St James's Park. And yeah, it's not often we've had to do this in the Premier League. Here is it reflecting on a home defeat against the team that isn't one of Manchester City, Liverpool or Arsenal. Yeah, it was a 3-1 loss against Nottingham Forest today and a defeat, I have to say, that was fully deserved and there's an awful lot to pour over from it. But before we do that, I want to give what is in many ways a disclaimer and I want everything during this video to be remembered within the context of this and I'll probably come back to it at the very end. And that is that Eddie Howe is the right manager for Newcastle. He is the overriding reason they are where they are now, whereby defeat in the quarter-final of a Carabao Cup, whereby missing out on the Europa League, having exited the Champions League, is seen as such disappointment, where it's seen as such disappointment that they have now fallen a few points behind the top four. He's the reason they are where they are during an accelerated journey of just over uh, just over two years now. So none of this is calling into question Eddie Howe. If anything, you know, I think it's time for a little bit of patience, uh, a little bit of understanding, uh, and certainly from the board and from supporters, support. And that was the message I was getting back last week in my own position as a journalist I, I I would echo that too I wrote something at the weekend for the Daily Mail which spoke to that now that of course was before then subsequent defeats at Luton uh, and here today against Forest so there are questions that need to be asked and I'm gonna ask them during this video I will never uh, never shy away from that but I just wanted to put on the record that in terms of the manager and you know I'm someone historically who has fallen out with one or two of them when I've uh, thought they're, they're not necessarily up to the job and you know, that would be my opinion allied with things I've heard uh, behind the scenes I've got none of that uh, now I haven't I've got no none of my own instinct to say uh, there's anything you know needs to be called into question about Eddie's own future and certainly I've heard nothing of that elsewhere so yeah I just want to uh, to put that down because I think there are and I'll offer this as, as mitigation the team is built on on a style and on a system that is so heavily reliant on intensity whereby they run harder, they run further and they run faster than the opposition and the numbers over the last two years would back that up. When that goes, what is left? Newcastle aren't Liverpool, they're not Manchester City whereby when they lose that, they just fall back on very good, outstanding, brilliant individuals. They haven't yet got that. What they are is a collective, you know, they're the, the old phrase, you know, greater than, the, greater than the sum of its parts. That's always been the cornerstone of Newcastle's success. Now, because of injuries, because of the schedule, those two things combined, because of mountain fatigue, when they lose that intensity, you know, what, what, what is left? You know, I, you, of course, it, it's Eddie's job to, to come up with answers as to that. And just because they've got this, uh, you know, it's not an excuse to go out and get beat every week as they're, as they're doing at the minute. That's six defeats and seven now. But I think there is a reason and cause for understanding. Uh, now, ultimately, on that journey, where you end up is you just end up with better players. And when you have the grueling schedule, when you have the injuries, you're able to fall back like your Manchester City, like even Liverpool can. They're able to fall back on very good players who score goals and dig them out of holes. I don't think Newcastle have necessarily got that and it needs almost everyone to be at it for the team to be at it. And it, isn't it quite incredible that for the best part of two years that they've actually been there, that they've actually been able to produce that week on week. And yes, it's fallen away now, but I just think it's a time for to, to understand everything I've just said there in terms of the reasons as to why it might be happening. But they aren't the only reasons, you know, two or three things can be true that, that that can be part of it that can also be problems out there on the pitch that I think do need to be addressed and that is by the manager or by the hierarchy or by both or with the players on the training ground I'm going to start with the reason I think they were beaten and they were beaten so badly and so convincingly I'm prepared to go that far and that wasn't a shock there today and I'll go back to so the reason I say this is and this goes back to comments I said to colleagues at half time and during the first half as I watched the game. After three minutes, Morgan Gibbs White, who was tremendous by the way, uh, ran straight through the middle uh, of, of, of Newcastle's midfield. Three minutes in, I made a note of it on my laptop because I thought this might be significant here, and it was, and it is, which is why I'm coming back to it now. Because what happened was <laughs> three minutes in, and there was that great big gap between Newcastle's defence and the midfield. Where who would ordinarily populate that in any other team in number six an anchor a defensive midfielder Gibbs White runs through the middle plays a ball out wide to Alanga and, and uh, I think it was Louis Miley end up blocking a shot or giving the ball with the shot anyway the shot was right but that was, that was the source of it the game then went on and every break most teams break down the wing at pace you know, through a full back and away down the wing 
Forest were just breaking right through the middle of Newcastle's midfield. You know, that 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 great big open space. And as I've said to you many times, we've got a great vantage around the press box, best press box in the country. But you, you, because you're able, you're able to see things, you know, you've got a, good, a great tactical advantage, and I'm not sort of professing I'm any tactical genius, but it was there, it was obvious. I turned to Martin Hardy, my right, Simon Burt, my left, and we all looked at that great big hole uh, and said that that's going to be a problem for Newcastle, as it's been a problem in many games this season. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute, because there was a question I asked of Eddie Howe afterwards. Newcastle then take the lead, Alexander Isaac's penalty. Is it against their own play? Not really, you know, Newcastle were playing okay. They had lots of territory, uh, lots of possession, they had five or six shots by that chance there, by that point as well. Louis Miley plays an excellent reverse pass. Isaac's taken out. Now, Isaac puts it away. Newcastle are 1-0 up. From that point, and this is something I've said all season, where's the control? More, not all season, because Newcastle have had a very good season in large part. More recently, you know, where, where was that control against Milan? Where was that control against Chelsea last week when they're in that winning position? Yes, they were unlucky against Chelsea. I thought they were terribly unlucky and they've done well to defend to get to the 93rd minute. But that wasn't because the midfield and the team controlled things. It was more just by the, the resistance of those at the back that they took it uh, as long as they did down at Chelsea. Now then, again today, and this comes back to, to what I want to speak about, and it's the midfield and it's the the failure to address what I said at the back end of last season, I've said repeatedly, you know, not signing a number six. Someone to shield the back four, someone to populate that area where that gaping hole resides all of the time. Look at the goals and the games Newcastle have lost this season, important games, you know, the, the Liverpool one here at home. Where did the goals come from? That position. There was the the Milan game as well, you know, I've, I've, I've honestly lost count, you know, of, of the, the, the number of times the goals have been scored uh, and teams have had a field day just running straight through the middle. Now, do you, who, who would you blame for that? Do you blame the players who are in there or do you blame the players who are selected or do you blame the fact that the club as a whole, the recruitment side of things, didn't address what I think we all, we all thought they needed? They signed Sandro Tonali, but even before Tonali's ban, it was evident that he, he wasn't that player. So you look at it and, well, who's, who's charged with playing there? Well, it's Bruno Gamores. Now, Bruno Gamores had a, actually had a very good first 15, 20, 25 minutes, but he was doing his usual, and I think Bruno Gamores is a tremendous player, but he charges round like a uh, like a superhero at times and it's he plays you know he can play like a superhero he dons that cape he does his flicks he wins tackles he, he he is a fantastic footballer but is he what that midfield and that team needs in the 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 middle of the mid three field three i don't think he is i think there's a i think there's a slight lack of discipline there uh himself and sean longstaff don't seem to be working together uh, particularly well like they were like they were previously then to the left of that where normally they would have joe linton to to cover and, and bail them out so to speak they've got Louis Miley Louis Miley individually still playing very well within himself but something in the midfield isn't clicking isn't working and that for me today was was where Forrest won the game and where Newcastle lost the game because they left themselves so exposed and even at 1-0 even at 1-0 again I turned to those same guys next to me and said they, you know it feels like a, a Forrest equaliser has come in here if they could just have someone to put the ball in the back of the net we never thought that was going to be Chris Wood by the way and we'll come on to, uh, we'll come on to him in just a bit I might even give him the three stars for the merit marks uh, given his previous association with Newcastle his finishes were, were brilliant so yeah so then when Ibs White Alanga uh, Hudson Adai on the other wing whoever it is who breaks Newcastle's midfield and then runs three uh, runs free on the back four you know Dan Byrne was picked uh, left back ahead of Tino Livramento now on reflection that was probably a mistake I just thought Eddie perhaps thought that he wanted his, his best, you know, that settled back four in there, which he likes, which have served the, 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 the team, the club so well, uh, and to combat, you know, that, that aerial threat of wood. What it hasn't allowed for, and is this a mistake? It probably is, you know, the, 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 the pace and the threat of Alanga on the right needed Tino Livermento up against that, not Dan Byrne. There was no surprise to see, to see that change made. And as a, as a defence, when a player like Chris Wood, who we've seen a lot of here, know a lot of, when someone like Chris Wood is repeatedly escaping in behind you like he was. Now, you know, that, that just that just shouldn't be happening. That that just adds to the to the, to, the, to the questions and the lack of answers really that you by the time Chris Wood got his second goal, it almost felt like trademark Chris Wood just running in behind the defence and scoring. That's ignoring the fact that he probably only did it for the for the first time seven minutes earlier for his second goal. And we need to talk about it. And that's the loss of Nick Pope. Now 
Nick Pope, because he defends that area between himself and the defence better, it means the defence can perhaps push up a, a, a little bit more and populate the area where I think Newcastle He's got issues and as well, you know, De Bravka, can he do better with any of the goals? Well, no, for the first one, I think he's exposed. But the, the second and the third, he doesn't he doesn't do enough to put wood off for me. He doesn't do enough to, to, to save the ball, to influence that situation. Uh, it, it was almost like a, he came out in when Wood went through. and you, should, you never thought you'd say this about Chris Wood. There was almost an inevitability to him scoring. And that was more so because of De Bravka rushing out to to face up to him as it was anything to do with Wood as well as he played again you know I don't want to take anything away from him but but yes I think you know a goalkeeper in January is a position for me I think they probably will will begin to look at and now I've mentioned there the number six and if you've watched these videos listened to anything I've said anywhere or written since the summer I've always said the same it comes back as well a right winger now Miguel Almiron there today didn't have one of his better games. Again, I'll put the disclaimer in. He has been a player absolutely key and absolutely central to what the club has done during the last couple of years. But should they have improved on a starting position in the summer with buying a, a new right winger? Was that potential there to upgrade on Almiron? Well, yes, I think that I think there probably was. Instead, they bought Harvey Barnes, who wasn't an upgrade on Gordon. He was always going to be there to provide competition for Gordon. But at the time, it never felt like an upgrade. Buy better, as Keegan said, improve your start in 11. Newcastle didn't do that during the summer. I've said that, and I know one or two people took umbrage with that at the, the time when Newcastle then went and won down at Man United. That was one game. I doubled down on it. After that, I stand by it now as well. The summer recruitment wasn't what they needed and hasn't aided them this season in terms of lightening the load on those who had done so well for the club last year. Which brings me back to, to Almiron. Now, today he was... The, the refusal to use the right foot is quite bewildering at times and you could see the, the, the exasperation among the crowd. There's one in the first half when he's in uh, in the, the right-hand channel there, comes to him on his right and he just, he just do, doesn't use it. He's, he's moving his body around in an unnatural position and someone in the dugout in front of us, Newcastle dugout, I don't know who punched the, punched the top of the dugout. That's the, that's the frustration there because Newcastle were working themselves. It good open, like I said, they didn't play badly. You know, they had lots of territory. They just... They just didn't have that that, that, that that cutting edge to them or, or you know, Isaac did okay, I thought he did okay, but you know, others did they did they look tired or has just come back to, to a quality thing? I'm not entirely sure. Probably a, a combination of the two. So uh yeah, you, you you've got that issue as well, you know, on the on the right and Newcastle at the moment aren't really able to change things up massively. Wilson comes on, but Wilson doesn't necessarily look at his sharpest either. And, and when they're chasing the game, you know, they're at 3 1 down in the second half. It, it, you know, I always take you inside my match report and what I'm thinking, you know, I've committed to that Forest victory from the minute they get their, their third goal there, really. And it never really felt as if Newcastle were, were going to come back into it, did it? So, uh, yeah, on Wood as well. Now, he is a player who played 20 times here under Eddie Howe and scored once, and that was a penalty. Yeah, didn't score once from open play, yet he's went and got himself uh, three inside 15 minutes there. Uh, and, you know, while that individual performance there from himself was excellent, his finishes what were almost messy esque at times. If a player like Chris Wood, who we know comes back to what I said, if he's doing that year, then I think you've probably got, you've probably got problems, you've probably got questions uh, need answering. Now, what did Eddie say afterwards? Well, I'll take you, uh, you know, the, the, the two questions I asked of him. First was, uh, if intensity is your identity, you know, what, what has happened to it? I didn't mean that in a, in a snarky way. It was, it, was, it was almost a compliment in that once that intensity goes, the team suffers. And Eddie said, well, you know, that was actually never his quote. He wanted to make that point. Uh, even, I think it is on the wall at the training ground. But anyway, maybe it was, uh, it was one of his players who said it. I don't quite know. But anyway, intensity is our identity as a mantra which has been associated with Newcastle during the last couple of years. That intensity is gone. Eddie said that he accepted that. He knew where the question was going they've got to work to get it back so and the second question was about the the holding midfielder and the the absence of one and Eddie said uh, well he denied that it had been a problem all season uh, but he said certainly in the last two now they've got to look look at the balance of the midfield because you know on those transitions it was you know just straight through the middle where where Forrest were running but the most telling answer he gave was a question from my colleagues and that was about do certain individuals have enough credit in the bank to almost be above question when it comes to team selection and he said no absolutely not every player has got to be accountable for themselves and he will make any changes which he sees fit to improve results or performances now what changes would you make well i don't think he's got too many options really what would he do would he would he take almiron who's clearly out of form would you take 
him out and put Gordon on the right and, and Isaac on the left as he did there in the second half but that didn't really work maybe it might be different from the start of a game you you don't know uh, I don't think he's playing with, it, with a lot of options and you know I'm going to I was going to talk about Louis Miley there I'll, I'll come on to my, my merit marks because I'm actually going to downgrade the the three to a two and uh, you know my defence is I think after bad defeats sometimes the pink uh, Alan Oliver and Gibbo back in the day did do this so the two star goes on to the play I was going to talk about there Louis Miley I just thought he was the one who uh, was brightest on the ball brilliant pass for the uh, leading to the penalty uh, yeah I thought, I thought he, had, he had a good game he had an okay game within the context of when I've done my uh, merit marks for the mail for the paper it's about six and a half out of ten and the one star probably goes to Isaac I just thought that he he was the one who, who looked dangerous he's you know he's a little jink and runs he's scored the penalty he's won the penalty put himself about but again it's a one star in the context of what he gets in the paper is probably a, a, a six out of ten there are a hell of a lot of fives uh, a couple of fours for, for Dan Byrne who had a difficult afternoon and, and Miguel Almiron as well who had a difficult afternoon. Again, you know, I say that with the context of these players have been absolutely tremendous for Newcastle over the last couple of years but it doesn't mean we can't analyse that performance out there today and criticise. And I think that performance was there even within the understanding of the tiredness and everything else. They're better than that. They are better than what they showed there today and they're better than what they showed uh, down at Luton 2 and it leaves them now going into... Wow, you know, the away form was one thing. They were coming back here and they were topping up on points and topping up on a little bit of confidence. Well, now that's that's gone there today and confidence going to Liverpool uh, on New Year's Day, a game where, I'll be honest, you know, you expect them to get beat. And I've I said it, I, I thought that... I thought they would get beat down at Luton. I think they'll probably go and get beat at Liverpool. And you know, it's not my job to be a cheerleader here. It's my job to, to think what, what, you know, what I believe. And then they go into the Sunderland game after that. And wow, that's just getting bigger and bigger uh, with each with each passing loss. Uh, and by then, of course, they'll be into January. And what should they do in January? It was a question again asked of Eddie. He said, "Well, you know, I'm going to wait and just see where where bodies are and in terms of who's coming back." Well, of course, Joe Linton was back on the bench today. Joe Willock is couple of weeks away and one or two others as well and Harvey Barnes we haven't heard anything negative on that since the last update that could be the the middle of January so Eddie said it'll probably be more towards the end of the month when they do look at recruitment well what would I do I'd do what they should have done in the summer and there might not be a market for this this time around but a number six a defensive midfielder someone who would offer control who would offer an anchoring presence the ability to free Bruno and go and do what he does best further up the field without the responsibility which he sometimes doesn't massively for me embrace in terms of being the player who sits in the middle of that that midfield three so uh, yeah and like I say as I touched on perhaps uh, I think they should perhaps even go and look at a goalkeeper as well so, so yeah guys not the jolliest of reflections uh, here on Boxing Day uh, for you from inside St James's Park we'll have one last scan I will be down at Liverpool uh, on New Year's Day I'll also be speaking to Eddie uh, in a couple of days time up at the training ground on Friday as well I'll bring you a video update after that in the meantime thank you again for logging on thank you for watching the videos I bumped into one or two viewers over Christmas different places quick shout out for uh, the brothers Jack and Joseph and the dad Jamie who watched the videos and their uncle Tony as well who I saw outside Rosie's pub actually the last time uh, the last time I was here following the Fulham game so uh, yeah guys please hit like subscribe comment you know the debate on here is always always genuine it's always insightful so thank you uh, thank you so much for that and I'll see you again at the end of the week okay take care bye bye